Thanks very much, Peter. And uh, hello to everybody. Nice to see a nice uh, mix of familiar and a few unfamiliar faces here today. Um, I wanted to, um, I think the last time I presented here was probably a little over a year ago, <coughs> around a year ago, and it was around the time of um, a report we published on the green economy again, um, called the an assessment of the environmental goods and services sector on the island of, of Ireland, uh, enterprise opportunities and policy implications. And that was based on work that Peter and EPS consultants had, had done for Forfoss, um, which was itself a precursor to this report today. So these are the kind of the building blocks behind this presentation, uh, which I'll t uh, go through now for the next 30 minutes. That was the previous report uh, that I just mentioned there, the Environmental Goods and Services report. That was a, an assessment of as we saw it in, in kind of mid to late 2008, um, an assessment of the green economy uh, at a very, I suppose, a fairly high level and some of the policy issues and uh, some of the policy blockages that are there. Um, when that report was launched in late 2008, um, within a few months, we were asked by our parent department, uh, which as you probably know is the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment, to uh, provide secretariat to a group, a high-level action group, as it was called, um, which really was uh, given a fairly tight terms reference, but was conveniently very much based on the, on that, uh, that policy report, which was produced in, in October 2008. And it was really to uh, kind of delve into some of the, um, the policy issues, some of the policy blockages that we had identified already in that report. To go into them in a little bit more detail and to see you know what are the very concrete tangible policy actions that need to be done uh, to if you like foster the growth of the green economy in the short to medium term and indeed into the long term so in this presentation what i want to do is obviously take you through that very briefly go through some of the uh the findings of this report though as well and um, below i'm sure a lot of you know those uh those but some of them have been updated um, and then, as I say, I'll be going into the, the detailed policy recommendations of the high-level group report. I don't have hard copies with me today um, of the presentation, but of the actual report, I didn't bring along um, hard copies. Um, I suppose in keeping with the theme of the report being a, a green report, uh, it's available on our website to download, and we have got a limited uh, print run of it as well. If you want to contact me afterwards, I can, I can give you some hard copies. So just to take you through then what the opportunity is, um, the first part of the presentation, um, the, the market certainly is growing and continues to grow strongly despite the, the economic downturn. One of the very few sectors that we've seen continuing to uh, increase, uh, albeit um, uh, depending on the statistics that you look at, maybe at a slightly slower rate than it has been, um, but it's a very strong growth sector. Um, the global market, you can take a number of figures here, but looking at most of the OECD data indicates the global market will grow to about $800 billion by uh, 2015. The OECD countries will account for the vast majority of this growth, and uh, the key kind of areas of growth within the OECD, uh, you're looking at you know, the usual suspects, I suppose, China and India, and some of the Central and Eastern European countries dealing with the legacy yeah. environmental issues of yore. Uh, other countries uh, are moving to capture these uh, opportunities. Um, as you can see here in, in America, I've just presented. Um, I'm not going to go through these. You have the handouts, but just to give you a flavor of some of the stimulus plans that are out there. Um, <coughs> 50 billion, for example, uh, 50 billion dollars in the US in the clean tech area, clean energy area over the next 10 years. France has 7 billion allocated, Germany 14 billion. China is a huge 221 billion allocated to green economy measures. Um, and these represent a very sizable portion of both the Chinese and Korean economic recovery programs. So what we're seeing is not, a, not only is there a huge amount of money going in absolute terms into the green economy internationally, but in terms of the green stimulus programs, the economic recovery programs, quite a large portion of that tends to be in the green area, but it varies from country to country. The Irish market uh, has been <coughs> estimated by ourselves and Peter's help uh, in that report produced about uh, a year and a half ago very conservatively at 2.8 to 3.6 billion euros, depending on how, how you uh, define it. Um, that excludes, importantly, the eco-construction sector, which, of course, is a very important sector. We, we just didn't have data on it at the time. This it needs to be updated and is being updated by Forfoss at the minute. Uh, the expert group on future skills needs is looking at this sector and they plan to update some of these data. So these are very conservative uh, uh, figures. 
we estimate that there's about 11,000 jobs on the island of, of <coughs> Ireland in the green economy, but again, due to the very amorphous nature of the sector, it's very hard to say. You know, there'll be some companies that are slightly or peripherally involved in green economy uh, activities and others that are ho wholly involved in, in green economy. So very hard to get a handle on jobs numbers. Uh, but I would say that's definitely a, a, a low, uh, a lower base uh, estimate. We see it dominated by four main sectors, water renewables, environmental consultancy and clean technologies, and then the waste and wastewater areas. And you can see there the pie chart. It, it's almost, uh, well, not quite, I suppose. You've got water and wastewater accounting for about a billion euros of the Irish market. About half of that then in the <coughs> consultancy and uh, waste management sector and then a little more, about uh, 700 million in the renewable energy sector. Again, this is based on uh, data from about a year and a half ago. Okay, there's a lot more information in, the, in that uh, policy background paper, the uh, Assessment of Environmental Goods and Services uh, report, which is also available to download on the website. Uh, I won't go into much more detail there. So then we were asked to look at knowing what, you know, the baseline information, knowing what the sector is roughly, uh, what it looks like and where the main uh, growth markets are internationally. What are the opportunities then specifically for Ireland? Well, certainly we see we have a number of key opportunities based on um, some of the key advantages or drivers for the last, uh, for the last decade. Well, first of all, clearly we have excellent natural resources in terms of wind and ocean. Um, we have had a lot of R&D going into this area, although coming from a fairly low base, it has to be said. We have a number of strengths in related crossover sectors, uh, things like finance and ICT and construction, where we've already a very well established uh, base of companies, both uh, national, uh, indigenous and uh, indeed the FDI community as well. All of these sectors very much not just tangential, I suppose, to the green economy, but there is a huge amount of crossover between green economy and other sectors, particularly the ICT. Uh, sector, which I'll touch on again uh, later. There's also been a key drive, of course, to, to get the cost of business down, and you probably see the National Competitiveness Council released their their latest report uh, on, on Friday. There's an editorial in the Irish Times today. And again, the key kind of conclusion or key recommendation there being that we need to get uh, utility and other costs competitive again, and energy costs indeed. So this is a key driver, given that Ireland has been relatively uncompetitive in these areas uh, for a number of years now. On the plus, very much on the plus side, there is a reputation, wrongly or rightly, that Ireland is perceived, I suppose, as a, as a green island. Now, I gave a presentation on, uh, similar to this a few weeks ago up in Dundalk Institute of Technology, and I was heckled and shot down for saying that. But I think there is a perception out there that the island of Ireland is green. Now, if you actually def want to define what that means, it gets a little bit trickier. But I think that's something that IDA Ireland and, and others, uh, Tourism Ireland, certainly try to capitalise on. And I think it's a strength that we can use uh, in terms of trying to attract multinational companies to base themselves in Ireland for, for a global market or for even a European market. There are also a number of potential first mover advantages for Ireland um, uh, from the demanding uh, regulatory regime in this area, uh, you know, there's obviously Kyoto and then there's post Kyoto and Copenhagen. Uh, kind of, although we obviously have that, we could have a discussion about Copenhagen, but maybe not today about the outcome of Copenhagen. But we certainly have the 2020 20 targets to achieve that's the 20% renewables target, 20% energy efficiency target, and the 20% emissions reductions targets. And then we have a very strong green public procurement target uh, by 2010. Um, on uh, to achieve 50% of all procurement in Ireland has to be green um, by 2010. The huge amount of uh, procurement, as you're probably aware in Ireland, carried out by the state through primarily the Office of Public Works and other uh, key departments. So again, huge, huge potential there. There is a strong potential for job creation. We were asked to look at what the job creation um, potential for the green sector is. As I said, it's extremely difficult to estimate given the amorphous nature of the sector and given the fact that it's hard to classify what uh, activities companies, some of the larger companies are engaged in. And of course, there is a time lag here, um, the data time lag. But we predict that the green economy has the potential in Ireland to uh, foster up to 80,000 jobs uh, over the next decade. So to go from you know, 10, 12,000 up to 80,000. And that's based on a number of um, comparable studies that have been carried out in uh, mostly in the EU on job creation potential there. We've kind of scaled them down to uh, the Irish scale and kind of adjusted uh, based on a few kind of Irish specific issues. 
But just to give you an idea of where we see these jobs, renewables, we see about 50,000 of that 80,000 jobs. Uh, we have a number of sources for these, which you can look at in the report. Eco-construction, 20 to 30,000 roughly. Um, and then waste, uh, a smaller number. And we think it'll probably be in the more kind of cutting edge areas, such as anaerobic uh, digestion. We see things like landfill and other areas being uh, not uh, key job creation areas. Uh, water, we weren't able to provide estimates. Um, that's something that we'll have to come back to. It's a difficult area to, to try and create uh, job creation estimates on. We weren't happy to, to stand over the figures that we were, uh, we were working on. The, I suppose what's interesting though from a policy perspective here is that uh, a lot of the international reports on job creation suggest that there's an array of skills required and that quite a lot of them will be high skilled and you know, high value added uh, jobs, smart economy jobs to use the, the parlance that, that is going around at the minute. Uh, quite innovative jobs, some of them. But there is a plethora of different types of jobs out there in the green economy, uh, some of which will require fairly modest retraining. Um, so I think that's, again, another beauty of this sector. OK, so on to part three, which is the main part of the presentation, which is what is required to deliver this opportunity. The report has about 55 recommendations in it. Uh, I'm not going to go through all 55 of them. So what I thought I'd do today would be just pick out some of the key ones uh, under a number of different headings, um, kind of opportunities that can drive exports and jobs. That was our key central, uh, it was kind of the raison d'etre of the group was to create uh, exports and jobs. So under these uh, kind of headings, renewables, energy, waste, uh, water, and other, I'll take you through some of the, the kind of uh, the, the key areas. And I'll, I'll talk you through some of the, the, the more important recommendations, because as I say, there's, there's over 50 of them. As I mentioned earlier, the whole renewable energy area we see is being driven primarily by the rising cost of fossil fuels, but of course there's other drivers there, such as the international targets we have here. As I mentioned, we're one of the most favourable locations in Ireland for wind and wave. Uh, we're close to, to many of the key markets here. The R&D base, although it has come from a low base, it's certainly emerging. It's converging with a number of other sectors, as I mentioned, such as ICT. And um, we see, and similarly then, in other areas such as energy efficiency, that there are very strong drivers, such as cost competitiveness pressures. Both new build and retrofit uh, opportunities, uh, new products, uh, new services, such as energy management. In the waste area, we see a number of drivers, such as, again, cost pressures, uh, regulatory demands. We, have a number of regulatory demands here, uh, the landfill diversion targets, etc. I'm sure you'd be aware of these. And I think there are opportunities here across the, the value chain here in the waste sector. Um, but a lot of them, I think, in the higher value end uh, of, of, the, of the sector. In the water, wastewater sector, we see, couldn't be more, I suppose, topical, uh, we see dwindling uh, water resources, both globally and particularly at the moment in Ireland, thanks, of course, to primarily um, uh, perhaps not a minute now, but uh, historically, thanks to our very old uh, Victorian um, kind of water pipes which are leaking. Um, <laughs> and of course, there are parts of the country now where up to three quarters of the treated water is leaking through the pipes. So I think the, the, we, we've estimated that some of the key opportunities here will be in things like leak control, monitoring, and supply uh, monitoring of, of supply networks and indeed uh, water quality analysis. There then is a kind of a catch-all uh, part of the green economy, which we've called uh, other or miscellaneous things like ecotourism, uh, agriculture, which um, is, is an important uh, part. We had some members of the group that were had very strong views about uh, the importance of organic farming and forestry and bioenergy. So we have a section on that. I should have mentioned that actually it's an omission. I should have mentioned at the very beginning of this presentation that the high level group is made up of a mixture of both. Um, senior civil servants in the, in the various departments uh, and agencies that have a, a kind of a remit in the green economy, but it also had members of, uh, of civil society as well, uh, and some, uh, I suppose, well-known uh, well entrepreneurs in the sector. Um, there's a list of those in the back of the report. So what are the key actions then to require to capture these, these opportunities? Well, again, taking, taking you through those, those headings of, uh, that I went through in the previous slide, in the renewables side, uh, clearly there's a continued need to develop the grid uh, that we see as being absolutely fundamental to increasing the penetration of renewables um, up to our 33% target. Um, also, domestic and international interests to the UK and Europe, um, which are being obviously looked at, and are, there are a number of uh, uh, interconnection uh, programmes that are uh, underway there or uh, at various stages of the, of, of the kind of uh, 
planning process, but we see these as being absolutely critical. Uh, and developing then ICD capabilities uh, of the grid, again going back to that idea of the crossover in various sectors, we see ICT and renewables being a key convergence uh, area. In energy efficiency, uh, the standards in energy efficiency need to continue to be strengthened, we believe. You could argue there has been a huge increase in the strengthening of the building regs. We see that they're probably not high enough um, and they need to go further. Um, and this again, of course, will act as a key driver for uh, some of the green economy, particularly the eco-construction sector. Um, on the introduction of incentives, uh, this was a contested part of the report, um, but in the final uh, consolidated version of the report, um, we did come up with a couple of recommendations around stamp duty and the carbon tax, which of course has been also recommended by the Commission on Tax and has since been implemented, um, although at a lower rate than uh, we initially thought it would be. We, the idea behind the stamp duty would be that on a, on a revenue neutral basis, we could uh, reduce stamp duty on low carbon houses. So for example, uh, like the way we have a BER certificate now, we could somehow try and uh, reduce stamp duty for houses that had a low carbon footprint and uh, obviously then increase the stamp duty for those with a high carbon footprint. Again, it'd be at the point of sale of, of the house. So that is one of the recommendations um, in the energy efficiency area. On recycling of revenues uh, from the emissions trading scheme, we suggested that this would be done to fund, uh, to continue to fund uh, state subsidised energy efficiency and green economy initiatives. Um, although we appreciate that, uh, you know, given the state of the, 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 the public finances, uh, you know, it would be quite a small pool or quite a small uh, amount of those revenues may indeed be uh, recycled. Uh, I would imagine a lot of them will, there will be pressure for a lot of the revenue to be put back into the, uh, the general exchequer. Key actions to capture opportunities then in the waste sector. Uh, first, and this is something that Forfoss has been, uh, I suppose, speaking about for a long time now, the need to create an all-island market for uh, waste by removing the regional waste regions and also to tackle the, the north-south issues some of which I'm not completely adidim on, but certainly there are a number of north-south barriers to trade, for example, in the recyclables. Uh, and uh, I think there's also a need to promote regulatory certainty in the market uh, through uh, kind of promoting or finalizing the structures. Again, that relates to point one. Um, Forfoss produces an annual benchmarking report in the waste area. And these recommendations are, are not new, but we reiterate the need to create certainty in the waste management sector. Um, also, again, as I said earlier, the need to promote composting and anaerobic digestion. These are very, uh, well, they're very interesting and quite innovative areas. There's a lot of value add here, and we see Ireland as having, you know, based on our kind of strong agricultural sector, as having a potential niche uh, uh, role to play in, in, uh, in kind of expanding into this sector. But on the water and wastewater, we see again key opportunities here uh, shifting public investment towards reducing the uh, as i said earlier the uncontrolled unaccounted for water is, is a key area and um, we have a lot of investment going into uh, into the into the water area we think this should be directed into fixing the pipes first uh, as kind of policy priority and of course that will develop expertise which can be uh, marketed or exported abroad Again, I think we feel there's a need to create a national market in the water sector too, not just in the waste sector. We suggested establishing a national water authority um, and also to introduce volumetric pricing. Um, again, this is uh, has been, I think it came out in McCarthy and it's certainly, I think, something that Minister Gormley is also in favour for. Now, there's a couple of issues, of course, with this, but we'd be suggesting, you know, that a certain amount of water would be given to each household on a kind of a pro rata basis or a per capita basis. And that, uh, that would be a very good incentive, I think, to, uh, to reducing water use. I think there are a number of other key areas that I wanted to mention that don't fit neatly into those uh, four or five key sectors. Um, and they relate to recommendations we have, which have gained a little bit of, I suppose, media attention in recent weeks around uh, developing green zones and the green IFSC, uh, creating world-class R&D uh, centres and removing basic hurdles to the green economy. So I'll take you through uh, some of the recommendations there. <coughs> on the green zones and the green IFSC, uh, there was an article on this in um, Friday's um, was it Friday Week's uh, supplement to the Irish Times, you know, the, the, the innovation magazine, I think they did a green supplement and there was an article on it. Um, we're suggesting that 
we would create a green zone. Well, there's two recommendations here that we would create a green zone, uh, creating an environment that supports the development of green enterprise and would market Ireland overseas. Now, this could be something along the lines of the International Financial Services Centre, um, where you have a, a kind of a clustering effect of, of companies coming together, uh, some reference sellers, as the IDA would call them, which would then attract in other uh, green uh, companies to create a kind of a, an area of, of, of critical mass, I suppose. Uh, the immediate opportunity exists to develop a green IFSC, as I say here, incorporating green investment vehicles. There are a number of areas that we talk about in the report, green fund administration, carbon trading, etc., and all of the attendant services that are that are required to, to, uh, to service these companies. IDA Ireland is also, of course, um, carrying out a number of measures here. They, as you know, have a number of business parks around the country, and they have uh, decided, they were on the um, high-level group, they have agreed to retrofitting uh, one of their business parks, one of their flagship business parks, to uh, a very, very high green standard, and uh, to try and then uh, get some some green green companies to move into this uh, uh, into this business park, um, and I think again that's an input from a marketing point of view that that makes a lot of sense. But I think in addition to that, we do need to have a look at this idea of a green zone, and certainly the IFSC group, which met with us as part of our uh, the background research we did, um, as you know, Forfoss provided the secretary to this group. We met with a lot of uh, companies out there, and we invited the IFSC clearinghouse group to meet us and to present on their plans here. Very, very interesting uh, plans. They don't want any, uh, you know, any huge kind of support. They're they're going ahead with it and, and building up uh, kind of a number of stakeholders in this area. All they wanted, I, th I think, was to be heard, and we agreed that the uh, the avenues that they're exploring at the minute in this area seem to make complete sense. And we are backing the IFSC clearinghouse uh, uh, idea again, which is to in a, in effect create a kind of a green zone uh, with a number of green financial services uh, companies moving in. There's a lot of empty office blocks, as you know, around the IFSC, so we would see. Of course, in addition to the physical, there's also the idea of having a, a virtual uh, green zone, which is something as well that, that we explored briefly in the deliberations, um, and there's more on that in the report. I'm conscious of time, and I'm conscious of a few more slides to get through. So the other area we looked at uh, on R&D was about building, we have a lot of R&D programs in Ireland in the green economy area. Um, we have, it would appear, uh, perhaps a need to consolidate some of these funds. Um, and by consolidate, we're not necessarily saying that there should be massive cutbacks in green funding, but there does appear to be some overlaps in some of the uh, agency funding. So as highlighted in the smart economy, a key challenge here is to develop a small number of world-class R&D centres rather than having a large number of uh, diluted and, and ineffectual centres. So to develop a, a network EU research centre, which is one of our key recommendations, we recommend pooling expertise into a number of key centres here and consolidating uh, some of the R&D funding programmes. Um, we also recommend developing energy research uh, strategy. We have a number of energy research strategies with Charles Parsons and, and others, uh, and of course SFI recently, well, not that recently, I suppose over a year ago now, um, took uh, the energy pillar as one of their key uh, funding pillars. Um, that's fine, but then I think there is a potential area uh, uh, or an emission uh, around the area of water and waste and we explore this as part of the deliberations of the group, the need to expand some of the uh, existing schemes into the water and waste areas. So, for example, we have an enhanced capital allowance schemes, and uh, that scheme is mostly aimed at um, energy technologies. So would there be potential there to fund some of the water and waste uh, technologies? Um, and I think to realise benefits from this investment, as I say, here we need to position Ireland as a test bed location. Now we know that's going on, and there are a number of test beds around uh, on the west coast uh, in the area of, of ocean uh, wave etc um, but we clearly need to address a number of other hurdles uh, which exist there and there are extremely technical uh, issues in the whole area of renewable energy some of the recommendations that we have in the report are extremely esoteric and uh, discreet uh, recommendations which can be uh, it would appear implemented fairly quickly but they are just kind of legacy issues that require to be dealt with and you'll see some of those i'm not going to go into them in detail but it's it's those thorny issues uh, uh in the renewable energy sector which anyone from the renewable energy sector here will, will, will know about i can touch on them later if need be 
Removing basic hurdles then from the green economy, um, clearly there's a need to address, as I said earlier, the technical and regulatory and planning barriers that are delaying um, the progress of renewable projects, the traverse lands issues, etc., uh, the single wire rule, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, to address the lack of progress on green public procurement, there's about 10 billion euros spent uh, in Ireland on public procurement and another 7 billion by uh, OPW. Um, a huge amount of money here, 50% of this will have to be green by 2015, clearly big opportunities here. One of the kind of recommendations that we came up with from a marketing point of view would be to develop the brand using St. Patrick's Day, which we feel is probably an underutilized uh, occasion from uh, an enterprise and from a green enterprise perspective to promote green enterprise. Uh, and so a uh, suggestion that I think I came up with on the group was to introduce an annual prize for eco-innovation. Um, which would be awarded on St. Patrick's Day. Again, it's just about the idea of trying to market Ireland uh, based on this perception people have of Ireland as a green country and um, a green economy, to kind of uh, market it based on that and to capitalise on that. Clearly, we need to be agile to, to build uh, competitive advantages here, even though we have plenty of those, um, but we still see that progress has been slow. Uh, the green economy offers a lot of potential. Uh, other countries have been moving at a rapid rate to see to, to capture these these uh, uh, the potential here, the opportunities. The high level group report, um, as I mentioned earlier, had a number of recommendations. Most of these are aimed at uh, very specific, quite discreet recommendations. Though there are some higher level recommendations. Most of these recommendations can be implemented at a minimal cost to the state. That was another kind of, I suppose. Uh, Part of our terms of reference was to try and obviously look at those which could be implemented post haste and at low cost. So there's actually very few that require additional, uh, very few recommendations that require additional outlay uh, by the uh, by the by the state. We recommended that a minister or minister of state be charged with overall responsibility for the report, and that a cabinet committee chaired by the Taoiseach would drive implementation. We certainly have got that and more in the sense that the report was launched by the. Taoiseach, Taunashta and Minister for Energy, uh, Eamon Ryan, um, and indeed the Taunashta has agreed to uh, take responsibility for implementation of the report, and the Cabinet Committee for Economic Renewal, which I think many would see as a, a natural home for this, has agreed to be the home for, for the, for the uh, report. So there will be a progress uh, report uh, for the Cabinet Committee on actions as they are implemented over time. So I know that was a very whistle-stop tour, um, but as I say, the report is available um, to download and I have some hard copies if anyone wants to contact me and I'm looking forward to, to the Q&A now. So. Thank you very much, Jonathan.